All right, now in Proverbs 31, we're going to get to Proverbs 31 actually uh, later in the sermon this morning, but it's such a great chapter. It's, it's mostly deals with the virtuous woman. We saw that starting in verse number 10, who can find a virtuous woman and gives all of these different attributes. And we're going to get into that a lot, a little bit later. Now, um, this morning, I know I already mentioned this, I'm going to be preaching on essentially what we're celebrating today being Mother's Day. Now, I have no problems setting aside a day to honor and to give respect unto mothers. Now, I know Mother's Day is not in the Bible. Okay, It's not something that, that God has ordained that we must celebrate. It's not some, some holy day or feast that we have to celebrate according to the Bible. But there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's not contrary to God's word. And honestly, I mean, Mother's Day really should be every day. I think we should be able to show respect and honor unto mothers and, that, and especially that job on a daily basis. So I'm going to preach this morning about this very important job and this very important role of a mother because it is, it is very important. It is very critical. And in today's society, I firmly believe that the role is completely downplayed and even looked down upon when someone is to say, I am a homemaker or I am a mother, you know, and, and, and they'll say, oh, that's all you do? And as we'll get into again later, when we look through this chapter about the virtuous woman, that's all you do? Tell me where you're going to have time to do anything else. Now, before I even get started with all this, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to state for the record, you know, we're an old-fashioned church. And we're not ashamed of that at all. Our beliefs are old-fashioned. People say, oh, that, you need to get with the times. No, we don't. Because I'll tell you what, this book is very old. The Word of God is old. It's not new. It's not some brand new thing. It's not some brand new idea that just came up. This is old. And we believe in the old paths wherein is the good way. And a lot of people might look at us and be like, well, you're fuddy daddies and you're this and you're that and call all kinds of, call all the names you want, but we're going to follow the right way. I don't care if you've got some new way of doing things that you think is better. These are established, tried and true and from the word of God. And unfortunately, we can look at our country today and I don't think anybody would disagree with the fact that our morality as a whole has been declining in America just, just decade after decade, and it's been in a very steep decline. And there's a lot of changes, a lot of things that have been going on in our culture that, that are responsible for this. But ultimately, I believe Satan is behind it all. I believe that Satan is the, is the mastermind behind the whole dip and, and downturn in the morality of this country. Now, the way he's been able to do that, and I th one of the reasons why I believe it's been happening so quickly and so rapidly is because of all of the, the media and, the, and the, the, the ability to, to send communications so easily across the airwaves, through the televisions, through, the, you know, through all these different devices now that we have. Satan's able to, to capitalize on that and get his brainwashing out so that, so that I mean, really... You know, Hollywood's not that big, right? It, there's, there's only so many companies, there's so many people putting out this stuff. So you don't need to influence very many people in order to have that influence spread across in a huge group of people, um, if that makes sense. You know, um, you, you get to the few, if he's able to just really get in and, and, and get to the few with a platform as big as the television set or, or the movie theater or something like that, then you could impact millions of people. And I believe that is what has been going on. But, you know, all of that to say this, you know, and, and may, maybe it sounds extreme, but it's true. That's, that's the way that is. Satan's behind, he's attacking the family, he's attacking everything that's of God, everything that's good and true. He is attacking that. He does not want to see the family be strong. And... Because of these reasons, you know, the, the, the traditional family has been attacked. And what I mean by the traditional family, traditional family is where the, the husband or the man is going out and providing and working and working as hard as he has to do to provide for the family, which is at home, where the mother can 
attend to the house, the children, and everything else that goes along with that role. And we have people today, literally, I've been called the Taliban for my beliefs on the roles of men versus women. And, I, and I've mentioned this in the past, but I think it's something that needs to come up pretty frequently in today's society because we live in a culture where, where the, the so-called feminist movement is trying to tell us that women don't really have value unless they become more like men. The feminist movement has been pushing for women to be working more in the workplace, for women to be dressing more in a certain way, you know, all these different things, whatever it may be. It's, it's, I believe it's taking away from the femininity, femininity of women, from their God-ordained roles, instead of exalting and praising that, which is what I want to do, which is what I'm going to do today, is, is, is really emphasizing and exalting and lifting up the role that God has laid out for a woman because it is no less valuable than that of a man. It's just different. We're different. I mean, for, for, for those of us that may be blind and can't see, there are differences even physically between men and women, significant differences. God has, has given um, women certain abilities that men don't have and vice versa. Now, I... Um, I preached about this last week about being a different member in the church, right? So we all have different abilities. We all have different gifts that God has given to us. And we need to be able to identify what those are and, and, and use those to the, to the, to the maximum, to the, to the utmost, to bring glory unto God. So again, you know, like not everyone's going to be the pastor. Not everybody is going to play music. Not everyone, you know, there's, there's different things we could do in the church. And I went over all of that stuff last week, but we shouldn't, be worried about the things that God hasn't given to us. We should focus on what God has given to us and magnify that. So, you know, if, if, if God hasn't given you the skills to say, play the piano, you just, I mean, it's just, you, you've tried, you practice, you do all these things, but it's just, it's just not really your gift, right? Don't focus on that and saying that, oh man, I can't believe, now I can't serve God because I can't play the piano. And this is one of the points I was making last week. But I want to apply that today because as men or as women, we shouldn't be looking at the things that God designed the other gender for and saying, well, if I can't do this, then I just can't serve God or I'm less of a person or something like that. Because that is what the feminist movement is trying to brainwash you into thinking. That if a woman doesn't go out and doesn't have a career and doesn't do all these things, then somehow she's less valuable than a man. And that is absolutely not true at all. Not in the slightest bit. That's just saying you want them to be more like what God has ordained man to be. And turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3, because we're going to see this. I'm going to prove from the Bible what, you know, what, what God has intended for us to do. And you know, this might be a silly example, but it might help you also to, to get the picture of what I'm trying to say here. You know, as a man, you shouldn't be all upset and focused on the fact that you can't nurse a child. Right? There is a very significant difference between men and women. Okay? Mothers have the, the ability, and that's their job, to be able to feed their children when they're young, to be able to nurse them. It's impossible for men to do that. I'm not going to get hung up on the fact that, oh man, I can't take care of my children now because I can't nurse them or have some kind of a silly thought like that, or even just think that, man, you know, I, I'd really be a much better person if I were able to do this. No. That's not my role. That's not what God has designed me to do. Men are typically, or not just typically, but always, I mean, men are stronger than women. That's the way God has designed men because he's designed us to work. My wife was just saying this morning, she's like, I don't know how he did it. You know, I moved all the, the trampoline, I moved all the stuff around by myself. It's because I'm stronger. It's because that's what God has made me to do. God has built me just through his natural way of men being able to have the strength to do those types of things because that's what we're designed to do. Whereas women are designed to do other things. And I, and I know I brought this up in the past before too, but I'm very 
one task focused. It's, it's hard for me to multitask. But a mother has to be able to multitask. You've got kids running around. You've got food on the stove. You've got this going on and that going on. And women, I found, are way better at multitasking than men are in general. Okay? Now, I'm not going to get hung up on that or caught up on it. It just is the way it is. I'm going to embrace the role that God has given me. And I believe that women should embrace the role that God has given them. We're in Genesis. Look at chapter 3. Because we'll see right from the very beginning, right from when God made Adam and Eve, there is a difference. Look at verse 16 of Genesis chapter 3. This is after they had sinned, after they had eaten of the forbidden fruit in the garden. Okay, God's going to bring a curse upon them, but even inherent within this curse, we're going to see the roles that are, that are laid out within the Bible for men and women. Look at verse 16. He says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So part of the curse of the woman was saying, Okay, now when you have children, it's going to be with pain. It's going to be with sorrow. And, and I know from the three that we've had, you know, that experience of delivering a child, going through that labor is not a pleasant one. It's not a, 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 a joyful thing while you're going through. It's a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. But that's what God has given to the woman to do. And not only that, it says, thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. So God ordained that, you know what? The husband is the head of the household. He's the one that's the ruler. He's the one that, that, that ultimately makes the decisions in the family. And this is what the Bible says. And, and again, you know, we have a, a society today that would say, because God has ordained a certain, you know, the man to be the, the head, that all of a sudden that just means a woman is not valuable. And that is just completely false. And that is just, you know, it doesn't mean that the woman is stupid. It doesn't mean that the woman has no value. You know, none of that stuff is true, but those are the type of attacks that will come against you just because you believe what the Bible says. It says, look, the husband's the head of the household. I mean, it's, it's, it's a job. It's a position that God has given to men. And it doesn't even matter what the reasons are. That's just the way he made it. Because in any event, you know, like, if you didn't have one person in charge what do you do when you, because a, a marriage is two people. One person says one thing, the other person says the other thing. You are going to have fighting and, and there is no say one over the other. This way God has said, no, this one, this person, you know, the, the husband is the one that has the final say so. And I believe that can settle a lot of conflicts if we could adhere to this. And it doesn't mean that, you know, and, and you know, a husband shouldn't be of just like this, this Hitler, Nazi, fascist type of a, you know, not caring about anybody. It's just his job. Just like the, 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 my boss at the company has a job where he's ruling over his employees. Now, he doesn't, just because he has that position doesn't make him bad or doesn't make me any less valuable within the company. That's his job. That, that job needs to be done. And he's the one that's filling it. In the household, that job needs to happen. Someone needs to be running and directing the, the, the household overall. And God has given that job to the husband. And it's, you know, it, we can get upset about it till we're blue in the face, but this is what the book says. But then he says unto Adam, look at verse 17, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So he's saying, Adam, in order to eat, you're going to be working very hard. You're going to be working by the sweat of your brow. And this is what was given unto man, that he's providing the food. We see that here. And when he goes out and, and, and works the, the land and works the ground and when, works whatever job it is that he's bringing in that food, it's going to be by the sweat of his face. It's going to be, you have to work very hard now in order to, because you think about where they came from in the garden, 
they didn't have to work very hard. Everything was provided for them. But now he's made Adam the provider and Eve the mother. And look at this at verse number 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So the, the very first two people on earth, Adam and Eve, Eve's name, her identity is wrapped up in the fact that she is a mother. She's the mother of all living. Now that's a great blessing to have if we have the proper view of that. Instead of saying, oh, she's just a mother. Which, unfortunately, that's what people... I have people have looked down on my wife time and time again because she's not out in the workforce. She's not out doing these things. She's raising her family. It's like, oh, that's all you do? If you think that the, the job of a mother is so light and so easy to say that's all you do, then you don't understand all of the things that go into being a mother. And that's the bottom line because you really have no clue what it takes to be a mother. Now, unfortunately, I know we live in a, in a fallen, sinful world and I know that things aren't um, ideal for everybody and people get themselves because of various sins and other reasons they get themselves into positions where maybe you have a single mom and say you know what I have to work because now you're filling the role of the father and the mother and that is unfortunate and I'm sorry that that happens but just because those situations exist doesn't mean that this still isn't the way that God planned it Okay, God planned it for a man to leave his father and his mother and to cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. God did not you know, want there to be divorce or any of this other stuff. He says, you don't know, you stay with your family, and when you find a wife, you two go and you start a new family, and that's the way it is. And, and you know, the man's going to work and the, and the, and the wife's going to stay and take care of the house. And you know, there's plenty of scriptures that, that go into that, but... Um, People will look at us and say that, well, you think you know, women are second-class citizens because you don't want them going out in the workforce. You don't. No, not at all. It's not that they're second-class citizens. I just believe the roles that are laid out in the Bible. It's, again, this idea of a woman, unless she's more like doing the roles that, a man, that, that God has ordained for a man, somehow then they're a second-class citizen it doesn't make any sense. And it's because... As a society, we've trampled on the idea of a mother and, and of a woman and true femininity. Now, their job is no less important than a man's. I've mentioned that before. And in fact, you might even argue that it's more important. Being a mother and raising children can even be more important than the job that a man does. And that can be argued. Now, I don't want to get into this you know, whose is, you know, the, the, the point is that they're both important. Both jobs are very important. Not one, one shouldn't be looked down upon. Now, I've got a message for, for children, husbands, and then finally for the mother. So we're going to go through all of them because today we're, we're honoring and respecting the mother. And uh, you could turn, if you would, to Proverbs 1. This is going to be directed towards children. Now, it's not all just for the younger children because we are all children also. We have mothers and fathers as, as well. So we need to apply this to ourselves as appropriate. But in Colossians 3, I'll just read this for you. Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So kids, if you want to please God, if you want God to be happy with you, the Bible says that you need to obey your parents. And parents is your mom and your dad. Okay, you need to be able to show them respect when you obey them, when they tell you to do something, you do it. God is happy with that. God is very happy when you, when you obey what your, what your mother tells you to do, what your father tells you to do. In Exodus 20, 12, of course, is it from the Ten Commandments. The Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. God wants us to honor our mother and our father. And, and you know, we're focusing today on the mother. God wants us to honor our mothers. And he's saying, look, if you do that, your days will be long in the land. God will bless you for that, but he expects you to honor your mother, give respect to her. Don't treat her like dirt. Don't treat her like garbage. You know, don't treat her like you're better than me. And I don't care how old you are. 
This goes for all ages. We ought to have proper respect for our mothers and for the, for the very fact that they're your mother, that they brought you into this world and they raised you and, they, and they, they brought you up. We need to have honor and respect unto our mothers. Um, and God is so serious. Listen to this, girls. God is so serious about you giving honor and respect unto your parents. He actually made commandments in the Old Testament in his law. In Exodus 21, verse 15, it says, And he that smiteth his father or his mother, that means if you hit your parents, you know what God's punishment is for that? God says, you shall be surely put, be put to death. God is, has, was so serious about, about that type of a thing happening, of showing that much disrespect where you would actually, as a child, hit your mom or hit your dad. God says that is so bad that you deserve to die for that. He also said that in, 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 in two verses later, he says, And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Cursing is wishing bad things to happen to that person. So if so, and, and, and a really bad curse would be like, you know, if you were to say to your mom, you know, Mom, I just wish you would die and go to hell. That would be a curse. And that would be so wicked and such a bad thing to do and shows so much disrespect. God wants you to honor and respect and, 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 and have that type of respect for your mom that he says, if anybody does this, they deserve to die. Because it's so important that we hold our parents in that type of regard and in that type of respect. Okay, and again, we, we, we live in a much more relaxed society today. And I don't think that that's better. I like the old-fashioned way of showing respect unto your elders, showing respect unto your parents, not even thinking about talking back to your mom or dad. This is the way that things used to be in the family growing up, you know, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. That's the way that families used to be run. But these days, it's you have kids calling their parents by their first name and they're more of a pal than a parent. And what do you do with friends? Sometimes you might curse out a friend, but you don't do that to a parent. Now, you shouldn't be cursing people out in general, but you know, if you do that to someone that's a peer, that's way different than doing that, because God didn't put the death penalty on that, but he did if you do it to your parent. And when you get into this type of relationship where it's just a friend instead of being a parent, you're going to run into these problems. God treats us very seriously. So the respect, we ought to have the utmost respect for our parents. Proverbs 1, that's where I had you turn. Look at verse number 8. Of course, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. The Bible says in verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Kids, mom has a law for you. She's laying down the law in the house. And she wants you to follow it and obey it. And the Bible says that they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head. That's a good thing for you. And chains about the neck. You should, you should always be mindful and thinking about the, the laws that mom has made for you because they're there to protect you. They're there for you to turn out to be a very good, godly person. Okay, this is very important that you keep these things. Mom, mom's role of laying down that law in the house is very important. Look at Proverbs chapter 15. And this goes into a little bit um, into the role of a mother. Proverbs 15 verse 20. Proverbs 15, 20 says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. So you see, you see someone that's a, that despises their mom, that hates their mom? That's a foolish man. That's someone that lacks wisdom. That's someone who lacks understanding if they despise your mother. You ought not to despise your mother. Again, um, you need to show your mother with uh, treat your mother with respect. Turn to Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19, a few chapters over. Proverbs 19, verse 26. 
Proverbs 19.26 reads, He that wasteth his father and chaseth away his mother is a son that causeth shame and bringeth reproach. So again, you need to be listening to your mother. Listen to the wisdom that she's trying to give you. Don't just chase her away and not want to have anything to do with her and, and despise her and, and treat her like she's, she's dumb or doesn't know anything. No. You need to, to listen to her and not chase her away. Otherwise, you're going to be a child that uh, uh, causes shame and will bring reproach. And then look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30, verse 17. This is one for you, for you girls to think about for a while. Keep this one in your mind, okay? Proverbs 30, verse 17. Listen to this. The Bible reads this. In Proverbs 30, verse 17, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. So the, the, the child that doesn't want to obey, that, that hates to obey what mom says, here's what the Bible says. The ravens of the valley, that's a bird. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagle shall eat it. It's talking about your eyes. That doesn't sound like a very fun thing. Okay, so we need to not hate to obey mom. You need to love your mom and respect the, the, the rules that she puts forth for you and understand that she loves you and, is, and wants the best for you. And that, and that you need to obey and respect mom because mom knows what's better for you than you do. And um, that's kind of an interesting verse in the Bible, but you know this is, this is a curse that will come upon you if you decide not to listen to mom and not to obey your mom. Now for the husbands, um, I'll just read this for you for sake of time. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, Likewise ye husbands... Dwell with them according to knowledge, talking about the wife, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Now, does this sound like the Bible is, is, is teaching that, uh, that the husband ought to, to put his wife down and to treat her like she's second class and to treat her like she's not important at all? On the contrary. That's why he says, Husbands, give honor unto the wife. Now it says here, as unto the weaker vessel. Yes, she is weaker. She's physically not as capable as you are, but you need to still show the love to her. Don't disregard her, but honor that. Honor your wife. Respect your wife for that. And as being heirs together of the grace of life. Look, you're both children of God. You're both saved. You're going to be heirs together of the grace of life. And, and the Bible says that in Christ there is neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. Okay, so if there's neither male nor female, you're not, just because you are in charge of the household now on this earth doesn't mean you're any better because once this is done away with, there is neither male or female. You're, you're going to be, you know, I mean, you're on equal footing in, in that regard. You don't have the same family structure to be the head of anymore. And um, you're heirs together of the grace of life. He says that your prayers be not hindered. And then also in Ephesians chapter 5, and I brought this up last week as well, but it's a great point that um, we can't overlook. In Ephesians chapter 5, this is where the Bible lays out, um, you know, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. This, this lays out the design for the family, the husbands and the wife. As I was preaching about earlier, there's just more evidence of why it's scriptural. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24 says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Again, proving that we don't look down upon women. We love them. I mean, as my wife, I love my wife. I love her as myself, or at least I ought to. I ought to love my, my wife so much that I'm willing to give up my life, which is like 
you know, should be like one of the most precious things to me is my own life. You know, I'm going to do whatever I can to, to keep my life and to stay alive. But if it means that I have to give up my life for my wife, I will do that because I love her that much. And this is the love and respect that men ought to have for their wives. So even though the man's in charge, it doesn't mean you're not thinking about the wife because you love your wife just as much as you would love yourself. So the things that you decide to do as the, as the head of the household, whatever decisions you make, hey, if you love your wife like yourself, you're not only going to be thinking, well, what benefits me? Because what benefits her is a benefit to you. Because you have that love towards her. So you see how, this, how, how it works out. And, and, and what the Bible truly is teaching about men and women. Now, it's not, and it's not a negative thing. It's not a bad thing. But the world tries to spin it and make you think, oh, that's just so horrible. But it's not. It's not horrible at all. She's doing the job that she was designed and meant to do. She can do that job better than I can do it. Just like the jobs that I do, I can do better than her if, I'm, if we're doing according to what the Bible is, has laid out for us to do. And the job of raising children is extremely important. It's extremely important. Now we're going to get to the mothers, the message to the mothers. Yeah, are you still in Proverbs? Turn it, flip back. I think you did the last place we had was Proverbs 30. Go back to Proverbs 29. We're going to wrap it up with this. Obviously, we're talking about mothers. You know, we, we've gone into a lot of the respect and the role and things like that. But being a mother means you've had children, right? Not all women are mothers. If you have mother, you had children. And the important, the reason why the job of a mother specifically is so important is because you're raising those children. Yeah. Now, as mothers. Yeah. We need to make sure that you're, you're raising the children correctly. And again, in the way that the Bible has stated. In, in Proverbs 29, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. So the Bible's talking about using a rod, which is, which is delivering and spanking, and reproving and telling why what they did is wrong. It's not just a beating, but you're, you're explaining, look, You've done this. This is wrong. And you administer the discipline. He says, that gives wisdom. When you do that, your child learns from that. They're going to grow. They're going to they're gonna understand more. He says, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Verse 17 says, correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. I've heard a lot of women that, that struggle with their children and often, sometimes it'll even lead to them not wanting to have any more. So I just can't deal with this. You know, my son or my daughter, they're just out of control and, and it's just way too much for me. Well, when they're left to themselves, that's what's going to happen. Now, you might not think that they're left to themselves, but... The Bible says that if they're left to themselves, they're going to bring your mother to shame. And that's why the Bible says in verse 17, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. If you're doing proper discipline and proper correcting, because it's more than just the spanking. The spanking is important, and I think a lot of people have, have, have left that off. But the instructing is also important of, of explaining and telling them what they did that's wrong and, and, and teaching them as well. But if you do that properly, if you correct your son, hey, he's going to give you rest. Yet not only rest, yet he shall give delight unto, unto thy soul. They're going to make you happy. They're going to be a blessing to you. My, my children are a delight unto us. Now, are they perfect? No, of course not. But they're disciplined properly. They're, they're corrected. And not only, now, you know, when the Bible says a child left to himself, that's not just talking about the discipline either. You need to be able to spend time with your children. You need to, you know, they need... The, it's not all about the, the negative, because the positive is extremely important, too. You need to be spending good time with your children, teaching them, loving them, having fun with them, you know, like all the different things that you do as a mother. Now, here's the thing. If you are out working a job, and again, I know there's different situations, and all this, I'm not getting all that. Okay, we're talking about the way that God has designed it. You won't have the time to really be able to spend with your children. It's just not going to be there. They take a lot of work and a lot of effort to raise 
right. And nobody can care for a child the way that the, the child's mother can. You, can. you can try to hire someone else to come in and do the things that you would normally do while you're off at work. But I guarantee you, no matter who that person is, they're not going to love them the same way that you do. Because they're your child. And God has given you that child. God has blessed you with that child and given you the job of teaching them and training them and bringing them up. He didn't give that job to someone else for you to hire. He gave it to you. And I believe that's the mother's job to train up the child. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, this is a very good reason why I believe the role of mother is so important. Because the training that they receive as, the, as children will stick with them through life. You are impacting a soul, an individual, a unique person that's going to continue on much past you, your Lord willing, that, that, that you know, when you pass away, your child still continues on and they're going to have children. The teaching and the training and the time that you spend with them when they're young is so important. It impacts their life for the rest of their lives. Very vital job. Very important role. Not one to be, to be cast aside or to be swept under the rug or to say, oh, this isn't that important. It is extremely important. If you love your children, it is very, very, very important. The Bible does not say in vain, train up a child in the way you should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If you're doing the proper training, it will stick with them. Now let's look at Proverbs 31. We're going to go through this real quick. The, the virtuous woman. Now, the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 is someone who's married because it talks about her husband, and it's, a, it's also a mother because it talks about her children near the end of the chapter. That doesn't mean that you have to have a husband and children in order to be virtuous, but this is the case for the, for the example that we're looking at in Scripture this morning. Proverbs 31. Now, there's a lot of things that we're going to see that a woman can do, even without having children, that are, that are virtuous things. But we're going to look at the difficulty of the job that God has given unto women and God has given unto to mothers, because I think as we go through this and we see... This is what God, is, God labels as a virtuous woman. God says, this is a good woman. A woman that does all these different things. And you can see specific attributes. And I think one thing we're going to take away from this is how hard a woman really works. Okay, The virtuous woman is a very, very, very hard worker. And these are all very important things that we're going to see. So let's, let's start reading. I know we read this in the beginning, but we're going to go through it again. I want to point out real quick, though, in verse 1, the way that this chapter starts off, it says the words of King Lemuel. So this is a king, King Lemuel, right? That these are his words. This is, he's the one who, who brought forth this proverb. It says, But it says, the prophecy that his mother taught him. You want to talk about the importance of a mother. Here's a king. Here's somebody who has authority. and you know, We would look at it. He's in a position of power. He's a very influential person. But who was the influential person behind the king? His mother that raised him. Think about that. Think about the, the impact that this mother, king Lemuel's mother, taught him a prophecy, taught him the Bible, taught him God's word from a young age that he kept with him that now got recorded in the Bible as God's Word. What a, what a great, I mean, what a great thing to, to maybe one day meet Lemuel's mother and to see what type of person she is because she was able to teach this great truth unto her son and obviously taught and trained him up appropriately to the point where he was able to repeat this prophecy that he was taught as a child from his mother. In uh, verse number 10, we're going to see, because she teaches them about finding a virtuous woman. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rupees. So again, if we're looking at value, a virtuous woman is extremely valuable in God's eyes. 
Her price is far above rubies. You know, rubies can get you physical wealth and dollars or whatever, but a virtuous woman price is far above rubies. Verse 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. So again, we see here, you know, if you're a virtuous woman, your husband's going to trust in you and love you to the, you know, so that he has no need to go off and get anything else from some, from some other woman, right? We see that, that the inherent blessings in being a virtuous woman, you know, you, you should have a good marriage. You'll have, you know, your husband's not going to be out cheating on you and doing those other things against you. Verse number 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So it talks about doing good things for your husband. Verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. So we see, you know, the virtuous woman's job, she's working. Just because she's not working for some other boss and getting paid money doesn't mean she's not working. The Bible says right here, she seeketh, she, she looks for the materials, the wool, the flax, and works willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ship, she bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night. Just about getting up really early in the morning and give it and providing food. That's what giving meat to her household is and a portion to her maids. It says, you know, she's getting up early before dawn, making sure all the food is prepared. It's a good meal. It's not some, you know, running through McDonald's and bringing food back to your to your household. Because in order to make a good meal, it takes time. It says here she's getting up early. She's she's providing the, the meal, her household with food. She considereth a field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hand. She planted the vegetables. She's out working in a vineyard, you know, growing some of her own vegetables and, and things like that and fruits. Verse 17, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. So a virtuous woman, you know, is not a weakling. She's strengthened because she's working so much, because she's out working um, in within her house at the vineyard and, you know, and doing these different things that she's doing. She perceiveth, verse 18, that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. So this is talking about not only getting up early, but staying up late. You know, a mother's job is never done. And a virtuous woman is, is going to do these things. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. So she's, she's sewing. She, we're going to see here in a little bit. She makes clothes for her household. Verse 20, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She's compassionate. She cares about other people. Right? A virtuous woman is not just thinking about herself, but also is helping out the poor and the needy. Verse 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So saying, she, she's already planned in advance and thought about her family. She's not worried about the cold weather because she's worked hard enough to be able to, to provide, the, you know, again, it's slightly different times. Here it's so easy to go out and buy clothing. Back then, clothing wasn't as easy to come by. We didn't have all of these sweatshops and factories, you know, pumping out the, the clothing like we have today. But um, it's, it's a big deal. Like a lot of people have like a change of garments you'll see in the Bible was, a, was kind of a big deal. It was, it was real valuable to have that. And, um, you know, here we see that the virtuous woman is, is making that type of, of clothing and making it so that you will be warm even in the winter. Verse 22, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. So she's not stupid. You know, the virtuous woman, we're not looking for just some, some dumb, ditzy woman. And, you know, this, this is a picture that people will try to paint again today. It's saying, oh, well, you are just some power-tripping man that wants to have some ditzy woman as your wife that you can just control and tell her everything that she wants to do. And this is the way that Christians are labeled, or at least people that believe the Bible. This is the, the, the picture they'll try to paint of you. But this is not, this is, it couldn't be farther from the truth. A godly man wants a virtuous woman. And a virtuous woman is smart. She's compassionate. She works hard. And she does a lot for her family. And is a very good person all the way around. 
She has wisdom. So she openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. So a virtuous woman is not going to be idle and sitting around doing nothing, and sitting on a computer, and sitting, you know, just, just wasting her time. She's not wasting her time. She's using her time very well. And um, it says in verse 28, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Showing honor and respect unto that important job of being a mother. The children should respect it. The husband should respect it because it's a very thankworthy and a very important job to be done. And you can see already all of this work, staying up late, making food, making clothing, doing, you know, all of this stuff, making sure all this stuff, making sure all the needs of your family are met in the sense that, okay, well, we're going to be clothed. We're going to, you know, we're going to have this and that we're going to have food um, and doing all the things that would be that would be her um, fall into her realm verse 29 many daughters have done virtuously but thou excellest them all favor is deceitful and beauty is vain but a woman that feareth the Lord she shall be praised give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates a, a, a mother's job, a virtuous woman, a virtuous mother's job is very thankful and it's very hard. It's very difficult. And we're recognizing that today because it's, it's, it's important and it's difficult. It's not easy. And we should not be looking down upon mothers who aren't going to work and, and just saying, oh, well, you know, that's all you do. And, and, it, it, and it, it really amuses me. When to hear people still have that type of a mindset when, when they hear that my wife doesn't go off to a job. As if, oh yeah, it must be nice. Yeah, She's just kicking back on the couch and just popping bonbons and watching TV because she doesn't have to go off to work. Yeah, right. <laughs> I work from home, so I know that that's not the truth. I know that she's busy. There's always messes to clean up, there's food to be made, there's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on that a mother is doing and is extremely busy. And I thank God that even in today's culture, because I know we live in, in, a, in a totally messed up society where now it's getting it's difficult to even survive off of one income. It's very difficult. I understand that's why some people have chosen to, to have both, you know, mother and father out working because it's so hard. But, you know, God has blessed us. We're, you know, we're not, we're not some rich family, but, but who cares? We're, we are rich in what matters. We're not rich in the financial element, but we're rich in the things that truly matter and the things of God. We have a very loving family, and, and I believe a lot of that has to do with with the fact that we're doing things the way that the Bible laid out to the best of our abilities. Are we perfect? No. But if we can follow God's plan and, and, and do things the way that He's laid out for us, it'll work out. And you'll truly understand that children are a blessing and not, not a curse, as, as some people might think. They are a true blessing. But um, we want to thank all the mothers that are here today and for the very difficult job that you have. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the, the wonderful role of a mother that, that you've designed. God, um, I feel bad for children that don't have a mother or don't have a father. They're truly missing out, dear God, because you've created us so differently. Um, we learn a lot from both, from the father and from the mother. I believe they're both equally important in a child's life. But um, today we want to recognize the, the fact that, that the mother's job is very difficult. And we pray that you would please strengthen the, the mothers that are here today that's, that have a lot of work still to do. And um, that you would please just help us to model our life off of what your word says. And to, to be able to not worry about ridicule or, um, or anything that the world might bring at us. Dear God, in their, in their lack of understanding and their lack of wisdom in this godless society that, that will mock at your words. But help us to be able to look past that, be strong in our faith, and to know that what we're doing is right because you said, you've laid out what we're supposed to be doing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.